Welcome to the program. Now, President Mohamed Buhari has joined citizens in paying their last respects to Queen Elizabeth II, who has died at the age of 96. Buhari says the story of modern Nigeria will never be complete without a chapter on the late monarch. He says she dedicated her life to making her nation, the Commonwealth, and the entire world a better place. The then Princess Elizabeth was lodging at the now closed Three Tops Hotel in a rural part of Kenya when her father, King George VI, uh, died and she became queen at the age of 25. Uh, during Queen Elizabeth II's 70th year reign, um, she visited more than 20 African countries and once jokingly remarked in front of Ismaili Nelson Mandela that she had been to more of Africa than almost anybody, prompting rapturous laughter from those around her. Having inherited a vast empire spanning the African continent upon becoming queen, her reign saw all 14 African British colonies gain their independence, starting with Ghana in 1957. The queen managed to maintain warm relations with them, partly through the creation of the successor organization to the empire, the Commonwealth. In 1961, she was pictured dancing with Kwame Nkrumah, who led the campaign for Ghana's independence and became its first president. Notably, the word empire was omitted during her coronation oath in 1953. Now, leaders from across the continent have been paying tributes to Britain's and parts of the Commonwealth's longest serving monarch. So, what should Africans remember about her reign and sovereignty? Well, to help us look at the life and times of Queen Elizabeth II, we have joining us from London an international affairs expert, Dr. Cosmas Anyakudo. He's also an associate lecturer, School of Law, Arden University in the United Kingdom. Thank you so much for joining us. Now let's let's take a look at yeah let's take a look at her reign and um, how she was instrumental to helping some African countries um, you know gain independence from Britain and not only from Britain but of course from other colonialists. I mean you had the Germans and of course others, including the Italians, holding sway uh, across the continent when she came on board. Tell us more about that. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, having me. Uh, first of all, I want to join all that hold British passports and all that are in the Commonwealth uh, to pay tribute uh, to uh, the uh, Queen for Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II for her life of service to the Commonwealth. As uh, you have mentioned, uh, it is uh, only fortuitous for us to say um, that uh, she was uh, announced queen. Her father died while she was in Africa. And uh, in your introduction, you did mention that she was in Africa many, many times. Uh, this is testament to her love for Africa and to uh, what she considers uh, the service that she owes to uh, the Commonwealth as a whole. Uh, for Africa in particular, uh, the Queen Elizabeth is going to be remembered as somebody who uh, was in reign when the various uh, independence um, uh, agitations were had. I have heard it said once that, um, uh, well, it's uh, in some uh, quarters considered that uh, she presided over the uh, British uh, support for Nigeria uh, against uh, the secession in the times of Biafra. But it should also be remembered that this was a queen who was, although apolitical, made um, very conscious efforts to uh, halt apathy. And I would like to end uh, the answer to this, your question, by um, uh, saying that uh, just recently, a few months ago, at the last Commonwealth uh, uh, meeting of heads of states and governments, uh, Togo and Gabon, not traditionally English-speaking countries, joined the Commonwealth. This must be a testament to her leadership and to the value that the Commonwealth holds. Um, I think her, uh, the, her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth will be remembered um, in very, very positive terms, and history is going to be very gratuitous to her. 
All right. Now, we've seen lots of um, African monarchs also expressing their condolences. I mean, right from South Africa down to Nigeria here and others. I mean, those who are sharing the grief of uh, uh, Prince Charles, who is now King Charles III, uh, say they understand what it means to actually have um, a prominent monarch like this uh, uh, dying. At this point in time, would you also uh, um, say that she enjoyed some good relations with um, African monarchs uh, considering uh, the, the, the effect that her monarchy had on the continent, especially when she came on board in 1953? Um, I believe so, because in, although the, um, in France uh, in 1789, they had a revolution, they executed their own king, but in England, the king has been, uh, the monarchy has been constitutionalized and institutionalized in such a way that um, uh, there is an ongoing debate whether or not we should do away with the monarchy. I don't think that we will be doing away with the monarchy in Great Britain uh, very soon, considering that uh, some countries want uh, um, to be Republican. The Queen was actually the head of state of uh, Nigeria, appointing the governors from the time of uh, Richard uh, in the 1940s to the time of Littleton Macpherson in the 1950s until after three years after um, our independence because we were not a republic until 1963. And she has enjoyed the um, a very good relationship with monarchs around Africa, the traditional monarchs who have not been institutionalized and who do not have a constitutional role like she has uh, being. I think she appreciates the value that um, a, um, the, and the dignity that a monarchy brings to the maintenance of culture, of tradition uh, in a country. Uh, the Queen would always have tea at four o'clock. This is what is called the evening tea. And uh, this tradition, I think, is not going anywhere because the Queen always had um, this uh, tea and biscuit in our garden, and she, in a way, embodied the culture of uh, the British people. So she appreciated that, and I think everywhere there are monarchs in Africa, they would um, also appreciate the value that they bring in uh, maintaining, promoting, developing the traditions of their people. I had to ask that because, I mean, in Africa here, we appreciate monarchs so much. I mean, it's a part of our culture and we didn't let that go. But let's talk about some of the developments that happened during her reign and how Britain had this very uh, uh, tough relations with South Africa, considering the apartheid that took place in that place. And just after all of this, she became so friendly with uh, Nelson Mandela that, I mean, she was almost always going to South Africa. Tell us how uh, someone like Nelson Mandela could easily forgive the British monarchy and its government despite what happened to him and his country. I think it is uh, important to understand the difference between the institution of the monarchy and the person of the monarch. Um, for example, uh, the uh, King uh, Charles III, as is now will be known, uh, is a very vocal individual. He's made very public statements on many occasions, particularly concerning climate change. It's, uh, while he was Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, he was known to be vocal on issues that were very close to his heart. The Queen was not so. The Queen was a political. She was not political in one way or the other. And you can imagine that she has presided over all shades of political governments in the country, whether they were liberal Democrats and, or conservative or labor. So the queen herself uh, may have a different opinion, a different uh, uh, belief, uh, apart from that of her government. She does not influence uh, the politics of the state of the United Kingdom or any of the four um, component countries. Uh, so it is important to know that she personally was against 
appetite. She was deeply religious. We should not forget that she's the head of the Anglican Church and that she has to promote the morals of the church. She has to promote the creeds of the church. And of course, uh, liberty, freedom of the individual, human rights are uh, the heart of uh, uh, republicanism. And that is what the country represents. So it is of no um, uh, surprise at all that uh, she would strike um, a very close relationship with uh, someone like Nelson Mandela and go on to make this uh, very public in the interactions he had with him and in how he related with him uh, during his death. And now that uh, she has died, um, I have not in the UK, I left Nigeria late last night at 10 o'clock and I arrived uh, uh, London this morning. And in fact, somebody at the airport said, uh, seen my British passport, one of the immigration officers said, well, you heard that uh, your mother is gone home and then you're going back to England. And I can tell you that even in interview, there was a man that was interviewed today. He said when his father died, he didn't feel such a connection. The Queen has been part of uh, the British uh, uh, life for 70 years as the monarch and uh, over 90 years uh, in the uh, in royalty and in, uh, and in monarchy. So uh, she will be greatly missed. I have to ask you that question because, I mean, the friendship between Nelson Mandela and the Queen was so very close that, I mean, he always referred to her as Elizabeth and not even as a Queen. And, of course, that relationship was well uh, recorded as one of the best that she had with some of the continent's leaders. Now, let's talk about other Nigerians and, of course, Africans who don't share these opinions of yours that... Uh, uh, late Queen Elizabeth II was a political. Uh, you must have seen the online debate that's ongoing between Professor Uju Anya, who is a uh, May Carnegie Mellon uh, critical race theory professor and uh, one of the world's richest men, Jeff Bezos, on uh, what happened during Queen Elizabeth II's reign and of course how uh, Professor Ojuanya is saying that she in one way or the other influenced some of the killings that happened especially in Nigeria during the Biafra war she supported the Nigerian government and all of that and of course in other parts of Africa uh, the Kikuyu tribe in Kenya and I mean all, all of those things can we totally absolve uh, the late British monarch of uh, not being involved in some of these decisions taken by her home government? I believe we can. I believe we can because she became queen in 1942. And we have to remember the world as it was in 1942. Uh, in 1942, there was a, a world war going on. And this world war uh, represented in what many people have uh, described as between good and evil. And it was the war that liberated the world from uh, oppression and. Um, and uh, and, uh, Fida and and fascism, and you can see that even the father of the queen, uh, uh, King George the Eighth, and their ancestors, even from uh, William the, the First in 1066, they were basically uh, uh, total monarchs. They were they had so much power and authority, and they were more or less. Um, uh, some people could describe them as uh, uh, having the um identity of emperors but this cannot be said of a queen that presided over the uh republicanism uh with uh, ghana having independence in 57 nigeria in 60 and many other countries she is the head of state of 32 other countries including new zealand australia and uh, canada and um i know that there are some people in quarters, uh, for example, um, in Cayman Islands and um, in Barbados that want uh, to uh, get a, uh, a Republican president, get their own president, don't want the queen to be part of them. But this is a gradual process and no country that has wanted this uh, has um, uh, failed in getting it. And many countries that are even republics like Nigeria are still path of part of the Commonwealth. So this is testament to the transition that has happened from the time of our reign to the present day. I, I am of the firm opinion that without the uh, 
implicit um, uh, involvement of the Queen that the pace at which the countries of the Commonwealth have gained independence would not have happened if the Queen was of the uh, totalitarian mindset. I believe that uh, she's a liberal person. I believe she's a person of faith. And I think that these things guide her. I can say in a, uh, anecdotally that I saw a letter from the Queen. This Queen, uh, this letter was written to a, a friend of mine uh, in um, a star region in uh, Birmingham. His name is John Noble. I saw this letter myself. It was written in just the 1980s. He was sending the Queen um, uh, uh, Christian tapes of uh, a certain minister, uh, William Branham, that had prayed for uh, her father when he had uh, multiple sclerosis in the 1950s. And uh, the, the, the Queen is a woman of faith. And the Queen uh, wrote back and said, I've got all these tapes. You don't need to send them anymore. And I believe that her faith in uh, being a Christian guided many of her actions. Her service has not been disputed. Her dignified um, composure uh, has not been dignified. The fact that she's not uh, been caught up in any controversial political uh, opera, you know, furore in the world is all testament that she's somebody who deeply did not want to muddle the waters, did not want politics to uh, be uh, something of a negative value, and that she must have uh, harnessed her, her role, her, 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 her gravity, the gravity of her office in making sure that uh, good things happened to the people of this world. I'm firmly of that uh, uh, view that uh, the Queen should be separated from the actions of our government and all the legacy uh, factors from the days of colonialism. I think we've come a long way from colonialism. Uh, but just before we go, in, in, in less than uh, 60 seconds, what do you make of uh, King Charles III and, and his reign? Do you think he'll be seen in the shoes of um, his late mother or even his grandfather? Uh, quite honestly, I think it is uh, common knowledge in the United Kingdom that um, this family is rooted in service for humanity. Um, the, the, the King Charles III has just inherited something that was started, I believe, uh, by his uh, great grandmother, Queen Anne, and um, uh, the royal last court. And uh, uh, I believe that he's very acutely aware of uh, his importance in the Commonwealth, uh, of his person and of his office as not just the head of uh, state of the United Kingdom, but also uh, the head of the Commonwealth. Uh, Prince Charles has traveled extensively in the Commonwealth. And I think um, the uh, apparatus of the uh, monarchy will ensure that uh, Prince Charles continues in the footsteps of his mother. It might not be in the same way because of his own idiosyncratic manner characteristics but I think we should expect very firm, dignified service from His Majesty uh, uh, Charles III. We must thank you so much. Um, Dr. Cosmas Anyakudo is an associate lecturer at the School of Law at the University in the UK. And um, it's good to know that you actually arrived at the UK just earlier this morning to catch up with all that's going on. And of course, we'll be needing you to help us with further analysis on what's going on there. We must thank you immensely for joining us. <laughs>